Hello everyone, Raymond Moore, Kilted Prepper. Hope everybody can hear me tonight. Uh, we were having some technical difficulties, so if you're on right now, let me know and uh, please tell me if you can hear me or not. Uh, so uh, let's wait for some folks to get in here in the room and then we start doing our jibber jabber. Uh, but tonight, good times and uh, do me a favor, I see one person in the room. Can you comment below and let me know if you can hear me okay or not? Uh, is the sound coming through? Please, check, test, check, test. Okay, good. All right, Linda Bob, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, I don't know what happened there. So I, of course, unplugged it and plugged it back in, and all of a sudden it's working. So, but, uh, you know. I want to welcome everybody to the to the show tonight. Let's give everybody a couple more minutes to get in here. Um, I am having some mint tea tonight, so uh, it's fine. Crap happens. Yeah, I know, definitely. So, um, but I want to thank everybody for showing up tonight, and I and I'm going to be trying to do these uh, every Saturday night at 6 p.m. Eastern time. So hopefully this can start working out for you guys. Hopefully that'll you'll be able to tune in more and everything. Uh, special announcement. I am sending out a special folder or a file, folder full of files. And I've got something like 14 cookbooks. And uh, I did a whole bunch of research and uh, I've been, I love collecting old cookbooks, first of all, but I found a lot of really nice vintage cookbooks in PDF format. And I love having things on PDF because I can put them on my Kindle and I have a Kindle that is specifically for my, 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 you know, preps and everything. So it's a complete prep Kindle and I've loaded up a lot of PDFs on that and everything. And then if anything happens, I can run it off my solar generator, power it up. And it's a great way of keep having a wealth of information and it uh, help you um, keep it in, in things. So I love having a Kindle. You do not need the internet to run a Kindle. So that's pretty nice. And, uh, and so in, in, in an event, if the internet went down, your Kindle would still go. And then also, because I know some of you are talking about well, EMP, uh, get a microwave and uh, a microwave. Go out and find a microwave and uh, cut the cut the cable off so that nobody will plug it in or anything like that. But a microwave is a small Faraday cage because it's a kind of a Faraday cage in reverse. In fact, that it's keeping all the microwaves inside versus letting microwaves in and or you know electronic pulses or so so forth but a microwave is basically a faraday cage and uh you're able to you know keep stuff in there if you have things you know get things in there in time and everything and close her up and it'll help you with protecting against emp but Anyways, I digress. Uh, I, I am getting ready to send out this week to all my, uh, uh, you know, Kilted Prepper Insiders or KP Insiders, uh, some, some, what, 14 vintage recipe books, as well as a number of files from the Ministry of Food during World War II. And, and so if you're getting my newsletter, it's free to sign up. Just go to my website and sign up for my newsletter and you'll get it. And, uh, but what I'll be doing on Wednesday is sending out a link to the zip file with all these different, uh, cookbooks in it. And these are all vintage cookbooks. And, and again, I, I really like vintage cookbooks and because there is just something about what we're eating today versus what we were eating in yesterday's or yesteryears. And it's amazing to me. You can look pictures from the 1950s. Everybody is actually thin and trim and nice looking and everything. What were they eating? And versus what are, you know, what, how has our diet changed so much? Because obesity is such a problem in the United States today. And, and how has our diet changed? And so I enjoy getting and reading old cookbooks and seeing what was in their diets that made their diets different 
versus the diets that we're eating today. I mean, particularly, I know one thing is the processed foods and the way foods are processed and, and everything. But uh, it uh, has has changed somehow. And it, and it hit somewhere around the 1950s, you know, that change. Because then all of a sudden, people started getting a little bit more overweight and everything. Again, that's around the time fast food came into, into production as well, McDonald's and, and so forth. So uh, those sort of things probably affected the American diet as well. But tonight, what we're talking about is how millions of Americans are going to be losing $82 a month per person in their family if they are on food stamps or the SNAP program. And this is going to take place in the beginning of March. And this is going to be serious, folks. I mean, if you think about how many people are on, on food stamps or some sort of food you know, subsidy by the government today, I mean, I want to say it's something like 30 or 40 percent of America is on, you know, or getting some form of uh, food assistance. And uh, what they did is in the beginning of the big C, they... Um, they created a bill or a, something to augment the SNAP program to gain, give people $82 more a month and everything because, co, you know, the big C shut everything down and, uh, you know, it uh, caused people not to work and everything. So those who are uh, receiving assistance, you know, kind of needed a little bit more to help and everything like that. But what's happening is come March this year, this uh, special allotment of $82 per month per person or per person per month in the family up to a family of four, I believe, um, is going away. And so it's projected that uh, families can be losing up to $258 a month and uh, out of their grocery budget. And that's quite a bit, especially in today's you know economy. And it's going to affect a, a lot of people. And so people are going to have to learn to really tighten the belt. And so what I thought I'd talk to you all tonight about is means of tightening the belt. And I'm a big history person. And so I totally believe in looking at history and what did man do back then and everything. And we have two prime examples of when we as a nation was basically hurting for food. One time is during the Great Depression. Another time was during World War II when we were rationing and, and, and doing rationing foods. Um, and so, and to, to kind of back things up, reason why this is so important to me and, and why I'm, I've got this knowledge is my mother was a depression era child. And so she was raised up in this stuff. And the interesting thing is, is that when we were growing up, me and my, my siblings were growing up, uh, we did not have that much money. And I don't think they really had food programs or anything back then when we were growing up. But I remember, you know, growing up and, and um, my mom, you know, because she was such a, you know, depression era child, anytime that we did have food or anytime there were sales, she was working hard to stock up the pantry and everything. But there were days and times where the pantry was rather bare. And uh, one of the things that my mom used to do is, uh, you know, she'd go into the back of the dumpsters and, and pick out a bunch of veggies and, and everything and this is when you know you were able to dig in dumpsters and you know grocery store dumpsters and get whatever food that you can find and everything it wasn't fit for consumption at that time or fit to sell and uh, and so what she would do is go in there and uh, dumpster dive for food and then she also had new butchers in town and and asked butchers to basically save meat bones and anything else that maybe they might be throwing away so that you know we would at least have something to eat but something that my mom uh, used to do with us when we were kids is have what was called rock soup and uh, we'd go to the grocery store and and i'd help we'd help her dumpster dive and you know do some of these other things but then what we had to do is walk around in our yard and then find a rock and it had to be the perfect rock and everything for rock soup 
And, uh, and so what we would do is we would help my mom cut things up and be very involved and she'd make it, you know, a big experience and, and all that. And then the person, you know, I don't know how we, how she figured it out, but the lucky child got to, you know, whoever that was got to drop the rock into the soup. And, uh, and so these are some of the things that she did to kind of, uh, not really allow us to understand what was really going on out there and what little money that we actually had. And so uh, we, you know, I learned a lot of my foraging from my mom. And I remember, you know, we'd, we'd always be going by, if we saw a mustard field or mustard greens, my mom would instantly pull the car over and we'd all run out there with, with bags or something. And she kept bags in the car and we'd uh, go pick mustard greens. Um, we uh, in some of the areas we knew that once a crop, one of the the, the um, larger farms were already picked, we were allowed to go in and glean, and so uh, we would go and glean peas and beans and corn and 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 so forth, and uh, but then also berries and any other fruit or or anything like that. We were always on the lookout for for food that we can forage and add to the pantry. And, um, you know, my mom had this gigantic, uh, I want to say it was something like a, like a 20, 30 gallon crock, maybe, maybe more. And uh, this and she got that one year because we had a plethora of cucumbers. And so she did an investment and got a crock, this big giant crock and uh we she pickled made pickles that year and those pickles lasted us for a, a number of years and it got to the point where uh, if we ever were hungry if we ever wanted a snack or anything like that mom would always go say go hit the pickle jar and uh you know we'd we'd go get pickles and stuff and so we would um do that and then um you know, so there's a lot of things that uh, kind of attributed or attributes to me becoming a prepper. And that was, you know, me coming up, you know, being raised up in this sort of environment. You know, preparedness was kind of already ingrained into me because we didn't have that much money. And so we had to learn to make do and we had to learn how to forage and we had to learn how to get creative with you know food and, and everything uh used to use the liners of cereal boxes for wax paper i remember that too yes i do remember that and uh and so it was it was kind of difficult growing up but again my mom made sure that we really didn't feel the impact or anything like that and so um interestingly enough during world war ii we had uh, what was called rationing or coupon books or ration books and a lot of things were rationed, you know, rubber, uh, food, um, gasoline, oil, anything, petroleum, um, itchy nose tonight. I don't know why it is every night, every Saturday night I get an itchy nose, but I have a list here and check this out. Uh, it, this is a typical weekly food ration for an adult. Now this is from England. Uh, I wasn't able to find one from America. But per week, uh, you were you were able to purchase. This was not given to you. You had you were able to purchase with your your coupon books and money. Uh, four ounces of ham or bacon. Uh, for one shilling, you could get you know the equivalent of maybe two pork chops. Now again, this this these coupons went along with money and and stuff. Uh, you were allowed two ounces of butter. You were allowed two ounces of cheese, four ounces of margarine, four ounces of cooking fat, three pints of milk, eight ounces of sugar. Uh, you were allowed one pound of preserves, you know, jelly, jams, things like that. One pound every two months. Uh, you were allowed two ounces of tea, one fresh egg. And, uh, and then also they use a lot of dry eggs during this time as well. 
but one farm fresh egg a week and then 12 ounces of sweets or candy or, or something every four weeks and so that was the common adult rationing during world war ii and if you really look at some of this stuff you know it was expected for you to have a home garden it was expected of you to to have chickens and and everything in fact england really pushed it and gave everybody you know one chicken per person per household and they had the whole chicken department of chickens and, and, and things where they would help you with, with putting together a, a, a coop, teaching you how to do it, uh, raising your chickens, all these other things, just so that you can augment your eggs and, and stuff. Uh, then, and again, we talk about victory gardens. I don't know if you remember those uh, victory gardens. And, uh, you know, people were really encouraged to basically rip up their lawns and grow gardens in in the city and anywhere and and so it was your basically your civic responsibility to to do this otherwise i mean otherwise you you may not eat and especially when you were only allowed these rations and stuff so basically you had to augment these things and then the cost of food was very expensive too if you didn't you know you know basically live outside of your coupon book anything that was not in the coupon book became you know somewhat expensive food was very hard to find and stuff and so a lot of the a lot of the things were rationed and so it was it was pretty tough during during world war ii now during uh the depression era the problem with that is that farmers were still growing food and everything like that but because nobody could afford it you know, they couldn't afford to buy food. And, you know, why why should farmers work for free? I mean, it's and so a lot of food went to waste because the farmers couldn't sell their food. And, you know, it was it was very hard for them and and things. Um, but, you know, another thing, too, and this is you know, this is a, a picture I found here in in for America. And it's Americans share the meat as wartime necessity. You know, men, women, and children over 12 years old, uh, a weekly uh, meat share, your your weekly, you know, share of meat of what you tr should try to, to eat was two and a half pounds of meat per week. Uh, children eight to 12 was one and a half pounds. And children under six years old was three quarters of a pound of meat. And this is something that they ask people to really work hard at that doing. And it says, you know, basically keep within your share so that you were able to, you know, help the war effort and, and things as well. And so it is, you know, these these are historical norms and times of when our nation has gone through hard times and, you know, food scarcity as well as. The ability not to buy food, which is something that deeply concerns me with the rising costs of food, unemployment and, and everything else there. You know, folks, we're already in a big R already. So don't, you know, don't fool yourselves that, oh, the big R is coming. No, the big R is here. And I mean, the, the people in government just, you know, they're they they have their eyes closed and, you know, they know what's happening already out there. You know, none of them go to to the grocery stores and really buy food. So now they tell us how many bugs we can eat. <laughs> yeah, Linda, true. Uh, but but to, to, to continue this uh, idea, uh, one of the things, and I said this earlier in the video, what I'm going to be doing is I encourage you to go to RaymondMoore.com and sign up uh, for my newsletter because on Wednesday, I'm going to be sending out a zip file of 14 vintage cookbooks and about 13 uh, Department of Food pamphlets from World War II and or earlier. But I again, I, I really like old vintage cookbooks. I'm a big fan. I, I love them. And uh, in fact, here, right here has got to be one of my favorite cookbooks in the world. And this is, you know, uh, Victory Cookbook, the wartime edition. And what's interesting about this cookbook is that it has a lot of your standard recipes, but in the back of the cookbook was an, uh, basically a miniature book in and of itself. Let's see if I can find it here. Where is it? 
But the back of the book, come on, where is it? Now it's making a liar out of me. Here we go. Yeah, the back of the cookbook had something called wartime cooking. And it really taught people how to cook utilizing the the ration method what they could do how could they they make the most out of of their rations and and again people i mean what four ounces of meat you know ham or bacon a week and it was it was very very you know costly so for example um uh they gave a whole they give a whole menu here of how to eat using wartime rations and so for breakfast uh, would be tomato juice waffles uh butterscotch sauce milk and coffee and then for dinner uh would be um leftover pork slices in barbecue sauce um and actually i'm gonna jump back here to sunday meal sunday meal seemed to be bigger they had a pork shoulder roast so that's why on monday for dinner they were able to have pork slices and then dinner on tuesday had lamb patties a lot of the un unusual meats like uh lamb pork and some of the others uh people were able to get at that time it's beef that was really, you know, beef and pork at times, but primarily beef was the biggie and keeping the soldiers fed and stuff. But uh, this is this is a super interesting book, and I love this book. I, I am constantly reading recipes out of it, and um, you know, in fact, here this is interesting. This is one of the the footnotes. This is "Will you win the war?" You know, but a lot of great recipes in here. And, and there is a lot of great stuff for budget cooking because, again, back then, people were, were, were pretty frugal. And, you know, they, they learned how to cook and cook frugally because a lot of these people went through the Depression. And then also a lot of people went through, you know, the World War II rationing and everything. But I say this because... Uh, what you want to do is I highly recommend hitting up your used bookstores and really, you know, start uh, looking for these sort of cookbooks. Uh, another book that I picked up at a used bookstore is this is a book. It's called Stocking Up and it's how to preserve your food naturally. Now, this is the, the early 1970s version, the 1974 version. This is 1974 version. Now, the difference between this version and newer version, because you can buy this book still on Amazon, but the difference is, is this one has all the barbecue and smoking meats and some of these other things that might use, um, what is it, the, the curing, uh, you know, basically the pink salt, the curing salts that you would use to cure meats and everything are talked about in this book. But nowadays people, oh no, that pink stuff, that, that sodium, you know, sodium, I forget what it is. Maybe some of you know that pink, pink salt that you would use to, um, oh gosh, saltpeter. And uh, so people, you know, you use a little bit of saltpeter in your food. Is it saltpeter? I forget, but maybe some of you know. But uh, it was back then that would help, you know, keep the meat fresh or keep the meat free from bacteria and so forth. So there's a lot of recipes and everything. This book, the 1974 edition versus the later editions. And so uh, if you're at the used bookstore and you see stocking up, look for the 1974 earlier version. So I think, did they have a second of another version of this or 74, the first one? Um, let's see here. 1973 is when it was copywritten, but uh, yeah, so 1974 is, is it. so if you can find it pre-1974, get it, but I go to used bookstores a lot, and I'm always looking for old cookbooks and, and things so that it would help, you know, better, because again, I'm, I'm very interested in what people ate, you know, in the yesteryears. Um, another book that I picked up this is a really good one and this author is great she, she marguerite patterson Patton, marguerite Patton, and she wrote this book about using rations for celebrations 
And because during that time, people have, were having hard times. So how do you do celebrations? How do you do birthday, Christmas, this, that, the other on rations? Because even after World War II ended, England was still on rations. They were still using ration books and everything. And so she, you know, the, 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 the Ministry of Food came up with, with books to how to, you know, uh, make things utilizing rations so that you can be able to celebrate. Uh, let's see here. Um, what are some of their, it talks about some of the days, you know, here's street parties. So it talks about how they would do street parties in, in, in England and, and everything. Um, you know, family celebrations. And again, a lot of these are based on rations. And again, cause in, in, in England, they were still using ration books and everything after the war. Potassium nitrate. Thank you, Michael. Yes. Um, but uh, a great book. But she actually has a cookbook. And I, you can buy it off of Amazon. But I like trying to find it, uh, you know, cheaper at books, used bookstores and everything. But she actually has a cookbook for uh, World War II ration. And, and so these sort of books are really great to really stretch your dollar, stretch what you're, you know, stretch the recipes and make unusual recipes that, uh, you know, with little bits of food. And then th this is another book. That, and this is called Victory Garden Cookbook. Now, Victory Garden Cookbook was, or Victory Gardens, was a PBS show out of Boston. But I remember this show when I was, when I was younger. And uh, what they what is so great about this book is that not only do they talk about, you know, what to eat, how to eat and everything and great recipes, but it is also laid out for your garden. This book and <coughs> again, I love how this book is laid out. It's laid out alphabetically by vegetable or garden product. And so if you want to cook something with corn. You know, you look look up corn, C-O-R-N, and you got corn recipes. And But the great thing is, is that she talks about how to better raise your corn. And she gives you growing tips. And she gives you gardening tips. And what she's learned and what they've learned growing the garden. And in fact, this is their garden that they had. And, and so not only is this a gardening book... But this is also a great cookbook. And so just, just great tips in this. And, and this, again, another one of my favorite books. And I'm actually uh, writing a book on dehydrating right now. And, you know, basically realistic dehydrating as well as weird stuff, you know, that you can um, um, do with your dehydrator. And so I'm coming, to, I'm putting this together and what I want to kind of do maybe is, is lay my book out kind of like what she's done is in alphabetical order, according to the item. And that way it's easily accessed, easily understood and, and so forth. But, uh, great book. I love this one. And, uh, Michael says also check out the BBC. Yeah, check it out. But uh, great stuff in, in books. So these are books that I've found on sale and it'll help you with getting, getting recipes together. And again, because there's a lot of recipes that are back from the olden days, olden days, uh, that we don't really hear of or we eat or anything like that. A lot of those recipes that, you know, our grandparents used to cook for us. But, you know, can we find those recipes today? No. You know, and so during hard times, what in uh, and, and a lot of things, and again, this is my own own family, because, again, we, we kind of grew up poor. And and so a lot of our our dishes, for example, I remember eating a lot of of um, hot dogs and rice. And so that was something that my mom or bacon, hot dogs and rice or bacon, hot dogs, and beans. Um, we didn't care too much for lentils, so we didn't really eat lentils too much. But we had, <laughs> we, it seemed like bacon, bacon and hot dogs were kind of the mate of choice for our family for a number of years. And I, I remember constantly mom making up recipes, 
you know, franks and beans or, you know, this is hot dogs and this hot dogs and that. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, what, what she's, um, another one, uh, like a polenta of sorts. And she would add bacon and hot dogs into the polenta. Sometimes what she would do, um, I mean, I'm sure some of you remember these as fried bologna sandwiches or make fried bologna or also spam. That was, that was another meat byproduct that we used to eat a lot when we were kids is spam. And so, you know, there's just a lot of things. And so I think that people are going to have to go back to some of these sort of really depression era money skimping, you know, rationing sort of recipes. But how you find these is by finding old cookbooks and so forth. And so, um, but these are some of the things that, that you can think about. So if you're struggling or anything like me, what we've done is we've stocked up on a lot of our dry goods. And so we have rice, wheat, barley. Um, we don't have any dried corn or anything like that. Um, you know, primarily because we, we don't eat much corn, but corn in and of itself really doesn't have that much nutritional value at all. Uh, the only way that you can really do it is use like pickling lime and let the corn soak and do all this other weird stuff. So at least you can pull the nutritional value out of corn. But, and, and then also, um, I know I like lentils, but you know, the rest of the family isn't too keen on lentils. So we don't have, you know, big stores of, of lentils or, or anything like that, but these sort of grain products you can use to, to make, you know, foods and, and so forth. So for example, barley, barley is a great thing to have around because you can use it in so many things. You can make some decent flour out of it, make decent bread out of it, but you can take barley and you can do this with any grain, barley, rice, grain, uh, beans, wheat, and everything. You can, uh, the basic recipe for cooking to basically any grain is a two to one ratio. So one cup grain to two cups water. And you don't have to boil it. If you want to think ahead, what you can do is do two cups water, one cup grain, and just put it in a pot and let it sit overnight. The cooking speeds up the 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 it absorbing water faster, but if you just leave it in a pot, a covered pot overnight, you'll you'll have the same you know the same results by just leaving leaving it out overnight. But uh, those are things. I mean, I remember my mom. We used to have a lot of the barley products, and so barley was a was a thing. But she would make uh, barley just by letting it sit overnight. And then in the morning, we would have our barley cereal. And so what she would do is, you know, warm it up in the on, on the stove or something, add a little bit of milk, a little bit of cinnamon, maybe throw some raisins or something into it or something like that. And that's what we used to have for cereal. Same thing goes with oatmeal. And, uh, but I always remember her having a pot of something sitting on the stove for, breakfast, lunch, and dinner the next day because we didn't eat all the barley for breakfast. So she would use it for soups and or she would use it as something to add to maybe a side dish. And, and so, for for example, beans, onions, barley. And uh, she used to call that Bob. And we'd, we'd have that. Sounds kind of weird, doesn't it? Beans, onions, and barley. But, uh, you know, we would we would do that. And uh, it was very filling, very good. Uh, when your mother made the rock soup, is it po is it possible that adding the rock added minerals to the soup? I'm sure it was. You know, the whole key is she read the story about nail soup or rock soup. There, there's a children's story and you can look it up on Google it, you know, and it talks about some beggar sitting on the side of the road and he has a pot. And he, you know, he's in the marketplace sitting there. Oh, I just wish we would have, you know, one carrot, one carrot's all I needed. And then I can finally make my rock soup or nail soup. And because this nail is the greatest nail or this rock is the greatest rock to cook with. And it makes such delicious, wonderful soup. But I just need a carrot. And so people walking by would just give him vegetables and everything, whatever he was calling out for. But that was um, the idea that my mom had in <coughs> creating rock soup 
so that it would get us involved. We'd help chop up. We'd make it, you know, she'd make a big deal out of it. And the rock was super special and, you know, so forth and so on. And so, but grains, going back to grains and everything, uh, grains are inexpensive. You can get a 50 pound bag of wheat for about $30 um, at some of these. Look at, look for your local mercantile. If you have a, a Mennonite store or an Amish store or something like that in your area, these people are the ones to talk to um, because you can get, you know, I, I buy from the Mennonite store all the time. This is where we get our, our, our dry goods and, and, and everything. And so, Wheat was, you know, about uh, $30 for, for a 50 pound bag. And then the same thing, you know, you go to Sam's club, get rice. Rice is going for something like $24 for a 50 pound bag. Uh, now we haven't been to Sam's in a while, so I don't know the exact price, but last time I was, I was checking it out. It's about that much. And then, um, but barley, barley is really good. Barley is expensive. I believe barley was something like $28 for a 50 pound bag. <laughs> And so, again, you can do a lot of things with barley. You can add it to soup. You can make cereal with it, morning cereal. Um, it's a very tasty grain. Uh, you know, that was the guy who was out of food and got the community to come together with, oh, I make soup together. Since he had nothing, he started it with a rock. Yeah, exactly. You're correct, Debbie. And so, um, you know, but look at getting your grains together because then you have a, a good, healthy grains versus you know the the grains that are being used like whole grain bread and or whole wheat bread and you know man they've, they've they've bleached and taken out all the great stuff and so if you're able to use the pure grain you're going to get a lot of protein out of this uh, hard red wheat is really high in protein for example and so same thing you can you create that as cereal and create that in you know instead of bob you know blah. <laughs> so beans onions and wheat and, and so, again, what it is, reconstituted wheat berries. And so, or reconstituted rice, or reconstituted barley, or lentils, or anything like that. And again, you don't have to cook these things. Let them sit out overnight, and they will absorb the water all by themselves. And the next day, you've got some grains and cereals ready to go and ready to eat. And so, but these are things, again, what my my mom my mom used to do. Another thing that that we used to do, I got itchy nose. I don't know why I've got itchy nose every Saturday night. But uh, perpetual soup. And, and this is something that she had during the Great Depression. And this is something my grandma used to have. I, I remember summers, um, we'd be hanging out with my grandma and everything. And she always had a pot of soup. It's just barely simmering on on the stove and and what she'd do is anytime she made anything for dinner or anything any leftovers automatically went into the soup didn't put it into the fridge didn't turn it into a science experiment or anything like that she and so just put everything into the soup and that was our perpetual soup or her perpetual soup and so if you, anytime you wanted lunch you would get a, a bowl of soup and then a big chunk of bread and she used to make cornbread all the time too. So, and this is, I'm talking about my grandma. My grandma used to make the perpetual soup and stuff. But these are things also that my mom did is, you know, when we had uh, a lot of, you know, if we had a lot of food going on, my mom always had perpetual soup, you know, when we were, when we were younger and she would just put all the leftovers instantly, bones and all into the perpetual soup. And, and so whenever we came home from school, if we were hungry or if that was dinner the next day or, or something, but soup was a biggie during the depression as well as during World War II, but perpetual soup. And, and again, you just constantly keep it cooking, constantly let it simmering, keep it a very, very, very low flame for all you horrible gas stove owners out there, you know. Uh, shepherd stew is also good to go. Shepherd stew, interesting. I don't know what that is. It's probably a, probably along the same lines as perpetual soup. It might be just the other name, but uh, I remember both my grandma and my mom always, you know. And when I say good times, good times was when we were able to have a lot of food in the pantry, and you know, um, our our growing up uh, thing situation was not very predictable. 
due to my father. And so a lot of times we'd have money and then there were times we didn't. And so my mom, you know, during times of feast, she would always keep the perpetual soup going and everything. And then she would can it as well. She can't, she canned everything. And so she would actually can soups during the good times so that we would have soup and everything during, you know, time, the lean times. And in fact, here's something I wanted to share with you. This is kind of my same idea. This is a, a jar of dehydrated leftovers. And anytime we have leftovers that I'm able to, to, you know, dehydrate, I dehydrate them and put them in the jar. And, and so, you, you know, when you're eating dinner, you may have just a little bit of corn left over or a little bit of beans or a little bit of this or a little bit of that. What I do is I dehydrate and I keep this is the jar I'm working on right now. And I keep it by my dehydrator and I dehydrate anything that we have as leftovers. And then once the next morning, I stick it in the jar. And I got oxygen absorbers in it and everything to, to keep it fresh and stuff. And, uh, you know, once this jar fills up, I add several bouillon cubes to it and then put it in the pantry. So this is basically a meal ready to go. So if anything happened or anything bad and we needed, you know, just have soup, this is a great soup starter or a great soup. And just fill up a pot, dump this in, boom, less the oxygen absorbers, of course. And it's basically soup ready to go. And this is why, one of the reasons why I just love, you know, my dehydrator. My dehydrator really helps us save money. Our dehydrator really helps us stretch out food. Nothing goes to waste. And then anything that might go to waste goes to the worms. And we're really considering about getting chickens this year. And, uh, and so that or the, any waste will also go to the chickens. But food stuff and everything, I love my dehydrator. And so this is soup in a jar, and I just constantly add to it whenever we have leftover or anything like that. So, but that's come along the same lines of perpetual soup and, uh, and, and, and things that, you know, what we used to do when, when we were younger and things. Um, you know, uh, let's see here. For those who just joined, and uh, Danny, love our dehydrator. Yeah, I love my dehydrator, man. I, I'm a big fan of the Excalibur. And in fact, I've just been accepted as being an ambassador of the Excalibur company to help promote the Excalibur because I just believe it in it so much. Buy frozen vegetables, when on sale, dehydrate them for soups and stews. Great idea, you know. Um, and so uh, some of the things, you know, and I mentioned this earlier, is I really want to encourage you to go to my website and uh, sign up for my free newsletter. And this is what I'm calling my Kilted Prepper Insiders. You know, so you're getting a bunch of inside information. Um, Michael Everson says, what about a freeze dryer? Freeze dryers are so expensive and they're great if you're able to afford them. But a dehydrator is so much more effective. I mean, you're basically getting the same thing, you know, for 300 bucks. And, uh, and about, what is the next caliber running nowadays? About 349. I am not a fan of these Ronco ones or these round ones or these anything else. I love the Excalibur basic or the economic and all it is one dial, you dial in the temperature and it turns on and blows forced air. And so, uh, you know, I love my dehydrators and I just, I think Excalibur is the best. I've, that's all I've owned. And I've tried Ronco's. I've tried these other round ones and some of these others, you know, they're cheaper and everything. Oh, wow. I'll just get a cheaper dehydrator. Well, they burn out in a year and you go out and buy another one and it burns out in a year. Whereas if you're just taking the money, bit the bullet and just bought an Excalibur, then you would be totally good to go. And um, my last Excalibur was what, 10 years old and I sold it to somebody and we still have the one that we have now, and it's still kicking like a you know like a racehorse. So you know it's a it's a workhorse for sure. But I love you know our our dehydrators. Uh, yeah, it's three thousand dollars for a for a food I mean freeze dryer. I just they're to me they're not practical. And uh, I'm going to be start running some experiments on my solar generator running my dehydrator. And I know that I can do it on low settings. And then, you know, how long would it last on making jerky? So, but I know on low settings, it would last quite a long time. And see, low settings being from 105 to 125. 
And that's basically where you're going to do most of your herbs, fruits, and vegetables is in that heat range. And so how long will my solar generator do that for and, and everything? Um, also, frozen diced potatoes is ones that are uh, shredded like hash browns works wonderful. You know what? Um, frozen diced potatoes. Talking about that, you know what I use? Tater tots. You know, if I want hash browns or anything like that, um, I always use tater tots. Now, the problem is with a lot of these products is they have oil injected into them. And, and so they don't dehydrate properly, even the french fries. Uh, and if you want to really check it, microwave some of these products and you'll feel the grease. So, and these are naturally, you know, they're naturally injected with grease or fats and, and stuff just because they want that crispiness and, and everything like that. But whenever I make hash browns or anything like that, I'm always using tater tots, zap them in the microwave, squish them up, throw them in the pan, boom. They're a lot cheaper than hash browns, but uh, be careful dehydrating some of those frozen, frozen potato products because they're full of oil. And uh, you don't want to be dehydrating anything oily or greasy because they will go bad. You know, anything that you do, especially meats and everything, you want to cut off all the fat. You want to make sure everything is fat-free, grease-free, oil-free, and, uh, you know, dehydrate things like that. Unless you are going to plan to eat them within the next week or so, and you're just, what you're doing is kind of extending the, you know, edibility. But if you're going to do that, why not just throw it in the freezer? So, but, uh, the dehydrator works just like the freeze dryer, uh, except it's a lot cheaper and this stuff will again last, you know, 15, 20, 25 years on the shelf. They have long shelf lives and I put everything in Mason jars and you can see, I've got, let me see if you can find it. You can see the oxygen absorbers. I have a couple oxygen absorbers in here. So it'll keep the food fresh and damp free and all that. So, you know. Um, but you know, so that's what I, I do is, uh, I keep checking, but website link isn't working for me. Um, website link, my website link, uh, Raymond Moore, Raymond, M H O R.com. Um, uh, here, tell you what, let me see if I can bring it up real quickly. Um, so boom, let me get my keyboard. Oops. Copy. So sign up for my free newsletter, and it's going to be on the right-hand side on Wednesday. I'm going to be sending out a bunch of cookbooks and so forth, and these are vintage cookbooks as well as World War II pamphlets on, you know, like potatoes and carrots and this and that and everything. The, the, the Ministry of Food produced all these pamphlets to help the people extend and, and everything, you know, have different things to eat because England was severely rationed. And so it was super, super hard during that time. Um, do you think dehydrated food will keep as long in mylar bags or does a mason jar? Um, I've tried my um, mylar bags before. And the problem, if you look at a bunch of this stuff, it's got sharp edges. And sharp edges and mylar don't do well unless you get the really good thick mill mylar bags. If you buy these cheap Chinese mylar bags, the little pointy stuff on the dehydrated food will actually puncture, put mini holes in your mylar bags and you, you know, basically lose it. And so uh, ask me how I know. This is why I use mason jars now. Uh, and then also, let's see if you can hear this. I mean, you know, the, the lid is very securely, let's see if you can hear this. I don't know if you heard a little bit of that air pop. Oxygen absorbers take the air out of the, of the jars because they absorb oxygen. And so what these are doing is naturally sucking the air out and, and things. And, and you know they're bad when they turn pink, but they take a long time to, to turn pink and, and things like that. And if you do, you'll pull them out through all new ones in there. But oxygen absorbers will actually suck the air out. So I'm a big fan of mason jars. And mason jars comes in all different sizes and shapes and and everything but i just love these two you know this what are these one quart large mouth um, i'm a big fan of these so what are these is this one quart i don't know so 
I just like these big ones with big mouths. So uh, let's see. Um, or maybe I'm using the wrong one. Thanks. Um, could you post the site for the dehydra you've been talking about? Yeah. It is. Uh, let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Hmm. I was trying to find the link here. Um, here, tell you what. Let me go here real quick and get it for you. Um, this is what I use. This is the nine tray, you know, and it's called the economy model. And uh, reason I like it is because it's just one dial. And I'm not a fan of anything digital because digital tends to break. So but this is the one. And right now, Amazon has the best prices. And uh, let's see here. This is going for $219. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Jump on that, folks. $219. Normally, normally it is uh, three twenty-five. So right now there is a sale on on Amazon for the Excalibur dehydrator for two hundred and nineteen dollars. Folks, jump on this! I kid you not. Jump on that price. Uh, and so you you know this is a great time because normally they're three forty-nine. And so they must be having a super sale or something like that. I'm going to post that to my Facebook and all my other social media and stuff because that price does not come around very often at all. So, but 219 and let me check this 219. Yep. So, um, here, let me see if you can see that 219. I don't know if you guys can see that or if it's, you're just seeing one big white screen or something. But uh, yeah, 219 for the Excalibur. Um, but yeah, that is an insane price. So, but uh, get it. And uh, this is the best uh, dehydrator reactor. I do not like anything digital. I don't like anything that is not forced air. And I like forced air coming from across, not from the bottom. Across will, will dehydrate evenly, where coming from the bottom, will dehydrate the things at the bottom first and so forth. So by having a cross stair coming from behind or behind your trays, everything gets dehydrated evenly and at the same time and stuff. So um, this is why I just I just love Excalibur. They've been around for years. They are a workhorse. The uh, econo economy model is what I've always had. I love it. One dial. Turn it on. Turn what temp and then let it go. I'm not one who needs a timer or anything like that because what we normally do is about three, four in the afternoon, I put stuff in the dehydrator and then next morning or so I pull it out. And so usually eight to 12 hours is what you need to dehydrate something. And so doing stuff overnight, easy peasy, lemon squeezy. Uh, how, uh, let's see, just signed up for your newsletter. Thank you, Linda. I appreciate it. Um, wow. That was such a, that much higher are they? were a few days ago. Yeah, they were, you know, 349 is what they normally are. So they must have a sale going on right now. And, uh, uh, you know, doing that. So let's see, less than 30 minutes until dinner. So um, good point. Yeah, it's actually coming up on 706 here. We've been on here for a long time. So but uh, do me a favor, go sign up for my free newsletter. And um, you know, I'm going to be sending out those cookbooks and those those files and stuff. Check these cookbooks out. They'll help you with really economic meals and things because this is what they had to do back then as well. And so also do me a favor. If you are not a subscriber, subscribe to my channel, please. And then like, subscribe, and then share this video with others. It's been helpful for you or anything like that. And also, you'll see that little bell there when you hit that subscribe button. Ring that little bell, and uh, you'll get notified when uh, I post up new videos. I apologize. I'm learning a new program right now called Camtasia. My other program did a stupid lame upgrade and just totally went fartsy-wartsy, and it's... <laughs> 
So I'm now using Camtasia. I'm learning how to use Camtasia. And hopefully this new week, I will start producing videos again. Otherwise, all I've been doing is lives. And uh, I like to be able to show you pictures and show you articles and everything when I do my videos and, and so forth. But, um, you know, I haven't been able to because I haven't been able to, you know, use my editing program that I used to use, you know, so which was Video Studio Pro by Corel. You know, I've been using that forever. And they did something, and it just busted up. So now I'm doing Camtasia. Um, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Wow, it was much higher they uh, were a few days ago. Uh, the newer model of the Excalibur Nine Tray Food Dehydrator Black it comes in black. Uh, uh, so this is the older model is what is cheaper, and why is cheaper? Yeah, the newer model is all digital and it's got a timer and all this other junk. I hate it. You know, I just, you know, I love the economic model and it's, or the economy model. And it's just one dial and you turn it on. Anytime you add to those digital things or anytime you add more buttons or say, all you're doing is you're creating something that is going to break on you. And then if you ever, you know, if your dehydrator ever dies, the Excalibur, you unscrew the back of it. It's a one piece unit buy it you know you go to the excalibur website or you can order it on amazon the one piece unit buy it slap it back on and boom you got an active working dehydrator again whereas if you have anything electronic or digital or anything like that if it's broken you know you're done for so this is why i love simple keep it simple stupid you know real prepping for real people you know ask me how i know some of this stuff because you buy some of this stuff and it just breaks on you when you really need it most and so i really like things that are simple and you know workhorses and that's why i love my excalibur but 219 dollars, folks if you can jump in there and go get it right now i don't know how long this sale is going to last i'm going to be posting it to my social media and everything and uh, letting other people know so that's everything i just thank you so much again for tuning in this evening uh, we're sitting at 709 so we've been here for 56 minutes and 18 seconds and uh, so like subscribe share uh go sign up for my free newsletter i'm going to be constantly start sending out more information utilizing my my newsletter and everything and uh and then ring that little bell so that's everything uh tracy do you use it for bread to rise yes i have and in fact i've used it to um make sourdough starter too. I use it for a sourdough starter to rise and things. So there's a lot of things that you can use the Excalibur for. You can make yogurt, you can use your bread riser. I used it for, for sourdough rising. Um, you know, just I'm my, I'm coming out with a cookbook and I'm going to be listing all these weird things that I do use my dehydrator for. And so there's a plethora of stuff. It's just not for beef jerky. You know, there's so much that people are missing. In fact, I made some great powder the other day. I made orange powder with using orange rinds and kale powder or magic green powder. And I constantly have a jar of magic green powder going all the time. So anything in the greens or anything, I always buy extra knowing that I can throw into my dehydrator and to my magic green powder, which you use for smoothies and other stuff. So uh, do you use, uh, do you, do you, so yeah. I do. Uh, signed up for the newsletter, and but I'm not good with emails. That's okay, you know. So, but I'm going to be listing a lot of tips, tricks, and other things in my newsletter, and really helping to give you guys information and, and things like that. So, that's everything now. I'm Raymond Moore. I'm the Kilted Prepper. I hope you really enjoyed this show. Like, like, subscribe, and share. Ring that little bell. And we'll see you next Saturday, Saturday, 6 p.m., same bat time, same bat channel. So goodbye, God bless, and kill time.